And if you don't learn something new from this, I'd be gobsmacked. <laughs> oh, good afternoon. And um, thanks very much to Sean for inviting me along. Um, it's kind of, when you saw the title, I guess your first reaction was, what? Or, <laughs> the title was uh, really catchy, and then I can't with this one. Okay. It's very, very academic. Um, but, okay, so let's begin by asking, what are exopolymers? And if I could start in, I've never been fishing for trout. That, I suppose, is a confession that doesn't go down very well here. <laughs> but are trout slimy? I bet they are. And when you fish for trout, I would imagine that your first reaction is, wow, you know, what a huge specimen. And then the second thing is, you want to make sure that you grab hold of it, it doesn't escape. The, the reason it's slimy is, of course, that it is producing materials. Those materials are exopolymers. So exopolymers are things like the slime produced by trout. And I would argue, and I can argue, I think, fairly successfully, that you wouldn't have any trout unless they produced exopolymers. It's not there as a, an act to make them difficult to hold. It's there for a number of very important functions, and particularly over the surface of the gills. So let's think about exopolymers in multicellular <coughs> organisms. Now, those of you that believe in evolution will <coughs> have the view that life began with a single cell. And it became more complex, and cells became two cells, four cells, whatever, until we developed multicellularity. And trout are a very good example of multicellular organisms. They're made up of lots of single cells. And if you have lots of single cells, it means that some cells can be dedicated to separate functions. They don't have to have the function if it was just one individual organism made up of one cell. And indeed, uh, in the case of the trout and in the case of uh, many multicellular organisms, there are special cells which are devoted to the production of exopolymers. And uh, the best example comes in looking at these slime glands, which are for production of slime. And one of the characteristics of this material is that it's produced in highly concentrated form but when it's expelled into water, it becomes hydrated and expands very rapidly. Now, if you think that slime is a problem when you're catching trout, and as I say, I have no idea whether it is or it isn't because I never caught one, but you guys, well, I've got one person sort of saying, uh, Mr. Porsche is saying, sorry, I've got to call you that now, um, <laughs> uh, is, 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 is suggesting it isn't, fair enough. Um, imagine how it would be, though, if you went to catch hagfish. And they, of course, live in a marine environment, and people don't go fishing for them. Uh, but that is an example of the mucus produced by hagfish. Um, quite large quantities. And uh, to give you an example of this material, uh, the illustration here... And this is my fly fishing rod, and I can't do both ways, but, no, but I'll try. Um, you'll notice that there's an illustration here with, I am a bit nervous, but not that nervous. Um, you'll notice that there is a spatula with a small white blob on it. Do you see that? Okay, good. Now, that is a blob of secretion from a slime gland, and it's then placed into water, and each of the successive photographs is taken five seconds apart, and you can see that that little blob has expanded over a hundredfold. And the reason is that the slime, original secretion produced by the slime glands in the hagfish, has now expanded, and it's expanded greatly in a very short time because it's taken on water. So slime is largely water. And the chemical constituents of the exopolymers are complex and will involve a lot of materials like polysaccharides. It will involve some protein. It will involve even DNA as a structural component, at least in multicellular organisms. So what's a polymer? Well, it's when we get simple molecules 
and through processes we add those molecules to each other to produce a polymer. And that is what happens inside the cells, that is what happens in the production of the exopolymers that then become hydrated. So let's turn to unicellular organisms, organisms which are one cell only, probably not of great interest to people that are working with trout. Uh, but unicellular organisms also produce quantities of exopolymer. And amongst these are algae, and we know that algae photosynthesize. And the process of photosynthesis is where, in the presence of light energy, carbon dioxide and water are converted to carbohydrate. And we know that the simplest carbohydrates, like glucose, for example, are produced by photosynthesis. So a photosynthesizing cell will produce lots of carbohydrate. And uh, in this diagram, which is a uh, photograph, which is rather difficult to see, and there is the algal cell, and you'll see coming from it, there are lots of tiny fibrils. And note the scale bar is 0.45 micrometers. And remember that a micrometer is one thousandth of a millimeter. So that gives you an impression of the length of these things. Would you like to <coughs> estimate the diameter of them? <laughs> They are tiny, but as a result of photosynthesis in an alga, in a single-celled alga, these polymer fibrils will be produced using excess carbohydrate because carbohydrate is needed by the organism for growth combined with nitrogen, which is taken up, and a number of other components. But excess is sent out of the cell. And remember, the photosynthesis is a light-limited process, and as long as there's light, they'll photosynthesize. What are the effects? Well, I'll give an example from the Adriatic. Sorry, it's not a chalk stream example, but the chalk streams have been very little worked on from the point of view of exopolymers. Um, these are diatoms, and you can tell those by their wonderful siliceous frustule, as it's called, a casing in which the alga lives, and they produce large quantities of exopolymer. This is exopolymer produced by individual algal cells, and uh, this is at the bed of the Adriatic, and you'll see that there are great swirls of mucus. And you'll see that the mucus has picked up lots of mineral particles from the bed. And uh, if you were uh, diving in amongst this and swimming around in it, um, it would be like swimming in... Well, you can fill in the space on whatever you like to <laughs> imagine, but it is just like that. And you could put your hands through it and you would get masses of, again, space to put in what you, you call it gunk. I don't know what you'd like to call it. And you'd get large quantities of this material produced. Now, it just so happens that the northern part of the Adriatic has received large inputs of nitrogen from the Po Valley because farmers put nitrogen on their fields together with phosphorus. Phosphorus is utilized in the river, nitrogen to a lesser extent, chucks out nitrogen, nitrogen a limiting nutrient in the sea, boof, a huge bloom of algae. And the bloom of algae, of course, will continue until such time as there's no more nitrogen. So you have lots and lots of algae, very little uh, nitrogen now after the blooming event. They still keep photosynthesizing. They throw out carbohydrate in the form of exopolymers. Remember those tiny fibrils? That is what the fibrils turn into. And eventually it settles on the bottom. You get decomposition occurring within the mass. That produces gas bubbles. Gas bubbles make it light and it floats to the surface so that you end up with a surface mass of material. And this is a tiny fraction, because at the time of the worst outbreaks, it went right across areas uh, as far as you could see. I mean, this is just protection of a resort in Croatia. Now, all that results from exopolymer. OK. That's exopolymer produced by algae. There are other groups of organisms that are single cells that also produce exopolymer. 
And amongst the most important are bacteria. And this is a cartoon where we run from left to right. We begin with the bacterium in its motile stage. They do swim by means of bacterial flagella, as we call them. Uh, they then settle onto a substratum and they produce exopolymer to cement themselves. And that's a process that occurs over seconds to minutes, very short time span. But once the exopolymer is secreted, it's then a permanent attachment. And the bacteria will multiply, and as they multiply, they'll produce more and more exopolymer, and they will produce a biofilm on that surface to which they've attached. And uh, it's not only, of course, bacteria, but also algae, as we've seen, and also some single-celled fungi. And they produce a biofilm. And this is an example of a natural biofilm. And uh, you can see it's blue in color. Well, it's blue in color, not because that's its natural color, but because I stained it with a special dye. And the dye that I used was a specific stain for exopolymer. So you can see, if you look closely, that there are algal cells, there are sort of mineral particles that have got wrapped up in it, and a large quantity of this blue material, which is the exopolymer. And one should stress that the exopolymer is very significant because it adsorbs chemicals. It's of advantage to the bacteria because they conserve their enzymes, which otherwise would be thrown out into the water. They could be thrown out into this matrix, like a gel. So they can get on with their business of decomposition, exactly like your teeth and plaque on your teeth, which you brush off with a toothbrush and a fine particulate toothpaste. They're stuck on very well. And they work away at the enamel of your teeth. And if you don't brush it away, they'll break through the enamel of your teeth. One of the hardest compounds we know in the human body. But let's not die. Let's get serious. Now, you get these biofilms over all substrata. I'm not saying that they're completely consistent. And it's conserving enzymes that the bacteria use. And also you've got all this material being adsorbed, becoming attached into it. And remember, it hydrates. So as it hydrates, the water then becomes incorporated. And if the water has organic matter in it, that's all incorporated in the film. And the bacteria will begin to utilize it. And they use it for their growth. And they'll reproduce. And they'll produce more biofilm. And then if something comes along and starts grazing over this surface, it makes them produce more biofilm, which gets more adsorption. So the whole thing is a very, very active process. Of course, we don't see it. That's looking at biofilms. I want to talk about exopolymers in another way, and that is in uh, particles and aggregates. Alan, in his talk, made the point that chalk streams have wonderful clear water. True, compared to many types of water system. But they are also, in a very short time, after they emerge from springs, and even as they emerge from springs, they contain large numbers of particles. We don't see many of them. You need a powerful microscope to see many of them. But uh, if you look at uh, uh, just a sample of water put onto a filter, you'll see lots and lots of particles. And I think you would agree with me that uh, it's easy to identify uh, perhaps a mineral particle, Lots of tiny particles, materials that you can't resolve. And believe me, there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of particles there, which have not been resolved by my microscope in the fraction which we call colloids. You also notice that there are some aggregates that look, how can we call them, flocks? Lots of particles joined together. And you'll see some pretty big lumps of material as well, which is clearly made up of something. Now, the flocks, by definition, are materials which are joined together by exopolymer. So they've probably been colonized by bacteria. There might be free exopolymer in the water, which produces uh, an aggregate. Whatever, the result is the production of loose flocks. And then... The other materials are definitely not loose flocks, much more consolidated materials, and these are fecal pellets. 
And again, forgive the coloration. The coloration is blue uh, because of the stain that I use, but this is a fecal pellet of a common stream organism. And the uh, point I'd like to make here is, well, first of all, we don't like to talk about fecal material. Um, so I'm on a loser here. <laughs> but I've made a career in looking at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and the animal which produces this fecal pellet does not produce exopolymer. And yet its fecal material is loaded with exopolymer. It can only have been collected originally as it was feeding or produced by organisms inside the gut which were stimulated by the conditions inside the gut to pump out exopolymer. Well, it's a combination of both, actually. But if I was to tell you that this particular organism <coughs> assimilates only 5% or less of the material it collects, that means that of the material it collects, and it feeds 24 hours a day without a stop, and it fills up its gut every half an hour, that is per individual an awful lot of unmentionables. <laughs> and if I was to add that in some chalk streams, for example the beer stream in Dorset, the animals I'm talking about are found in population densities <clears throat> of up to 100,000 individuals per square metre of substratum, that's an awful lot of... Sh sorry. <laughs> So these are really, really important, as are flocks, as are all particles, as are anything connected with exopolymer, as are biofilms. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about the way we've used exopolymers. And this takes me into drinking water and wastewater. And I'm not going to dwell on this because uh, it's a sensitive topic in the river chess. Uh, we've already heard about abstraction and so on. Um, where water is treated, there are several processes by which uh, the water industry treats water to make it potable. Um, Affinity uses complex membrane systems, but, but common methods are to promote flocculation and coagulation. Now, flocculation we've already considered. That's where you have binding with exopolymer. So exopolymer binds with itself and with other components, and then things stick to it, just like they do on biofilms, and that means that you've got flocks which you can collect, and therefore you remove impurities. Coagulation is where we use chemicals that neutralize charges, and common chemicals are what we call divalent cations, that is, things like calcium, which contain two pluses, and Alan again was mentioning that not only do we have high calcium in chalk stream water, we also have high magnesium that also has two pluses and is therefore a great coagulating agent. And once you have coagulation, you then have bridging with exopolymers in flocculation, means that you clean up your drinking water using exopolymers. Another method which we use for uh, treating uh, drinking water is by the use of sand filters. And sand filters are basically large beds which have a sandy bottom, and the water is passed through the sand, and it's a very effective way of cleaning drinking water. Now, the sand, of course, plays an important function in that between the sand grains, it acts as a, a sieve for particles, but that's a tiny fraction of the process. The key process is the biofilm that develops over the sand grains. And you can demonstrate this very easily because you can get a sand filter and you can run it immediately after it's relayed and you can have a sand filter that you then <coughs> run some time after it's been relayed and the quality of the water after time is hugely better than initially. You must have a biofilm. And there are complex communities of organisms which graze on the biofilm which stimulate therefore its growth more sites for adsorption, and then they grow. And that happens whether the filter is covered and underground or exposed to the atmosphere. 
when it's exposed to the atmosphere, you get things like midges that come in and they keep the surface of the filter very much open and they do it by the production of fecal pellets, um, which are an essential component in these open filter beds for the production of your drinking water. <laughs> Um, use of exopolymers in sewage treatment. Uh, two basic approaches to sewage treatment. The use of trickling filters, which again consist of a bed, this time a fairly coarse but porous material, through which the water trickles, thus trickling filter. And again, the process is one of the production of a biofilm. In this case, the biofilm also is grazed to keep it active, and you'll find that there are large numbers of invertebrates of various kinds, including insect larvae that are in this community. And this is one of the reasons why you get masses of insects emerging from these areas. And uh, the insects uh, fly off and, and are fed upon by uh, swallows and so on. So the ultimate is that you convert uh, rather mucky things in the water into swallows. <laughs> which is all very poetic. <laughs> But the important thing to remember is that none of it would happen if there wasn't exopolymer. It just would not happen. Exopolymer is essential for all forms of wastewater treatment. And the other wastewater treatment that we're perhaps more familiar with is the activated sludge process. <coughs> and this is one that occupies the interests of members like myself of the River Chess Association. And activated sludge is where we find that you get... Uh, a primary filtration of the sewage material and then the material is uh, uh, treated in various ways. It might be stirred, it might have uh, uh, gas passed into it, a number of different methods. It, it certainly increases the rate at which particles knock into each other. Interesting I mentioned bubbles. You know, people ignore bubbles. Bubbles are terribly important features of aquatic systems. That's another lecture. I'll stop <laughs> on that. <coughs> but the activated sludge process is causing things to bash into each other and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So we get big aggregates of flock. And then when we turn the aeration off or we turn the circulation off, that sediments and we can remove it. And the result is pretty clean water. Except when it goes wrong. <laughs> sure. Now that process, again, is entirely dependent on exopolymer. So let's go back to chalk streams because that's what we know and love. And um, so this is a chalk stream. And very characteristic, we know what they look like. There's one outside. And uh, it's taken midway through uh, the year, early, early summer, and lots of water crowfoot. And the water crowfoot will make channels because it ducts water around itself to make good flow. And I know this is of real interest to trout fisher persons. And uh, if we look a little more closely at that uh, water crowfoot, we'll notice that underneath it, there's lots and lots of sediment. And if we look at that sediment closely, we'll notice that it contains lots of organic material. And if we look at it very closely, at a different level, we'll see that of that organic matter, a chunk of it, a significant percentage, usually more than 30%, is made up of fecal pellets. And the fecal pellets are kind of interesting in that they produce a slow-release fertilizer. They're pellets, so it takes a bit of time for the materials to come out of them and for them to be broken down. And they'll be colonized in turn by bacteria. They'll have bacteria inside them, which produce the original exopolymer that bound the pellet together. And heck, hang on, this is fantastic. They're producing nutrients right above the rootstock of the plant. So the plant has engineered the flow around itself to keep its growing leaves clean for photosynthesis. It does it helps trout too, but for, you know, I mean, the plant didn't evolve that for trout, honestly. <laughs> and it's developed a mechanism to accumulate organic matter and to allow that organic matter to decompose right above its rootstock to promote its own growth. Fan 
fantastic, and you think that plants don't do anything. <laughs> now, when the plant dies, it's, of course, decomposed. What does the decomposition? Bacteria and fungi. They colonize, add biofilm, and uh, as we know, there's a lot of invertebrates living in the river. Think your mayflies, for example. What do mayflies feed on? Or dead organic matter. Well, come on. I mean, dead organic matter. We, 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 we have our roughage, you know, because we're told that roughage is very good for us and so on, etc. But if you think about it, roughage is good for you because it comes out, the, well, yeah, even relatively unaffected by digestion. Roughage doesn't contain lots of easily available organic compounds. It's, in fact, the material that's left over after the easy compounds have gone. So you need pretty good fungal enzymes. You need pretty good bacterial enzymes to break that stuff down. And they will colonize and begin the breakdown process. Now, put yourself in the position of being a mayfly larva. It's difficult, I know, but try and do that. Now, you're faced with a load of dead leaves. What do you think to yourself? You think, hmm, lovely, tasty dead leaf. No, of course you don't. You think, well, no, you don't think, actually, because, <laughs> because it's not gone to that level. But the key thing is that in America, they, they've got an explanation for this. They call it the peanut, butter, and cracker model. Because we have biscuits instead of crackers, and we have jam or whatever instead of peanut butter or jelly. But, but get the idea that if you're a kid and uh, you're given peanut butter and cracker, the cracker is just a damned awful vehicle to get at the peanut butter, right? So you get hold of that and you go, mm -hmm. and uh, more, you know, and more peanut butter goes on. So it's just a vehicle for getting peanut butter. Now, the leaf and its colonizing microorganisms and biofilm and thus exopolymers is exactly the same. What the mayfly is doing is chopping up bits of stuff, and by chopping it up, it's making it smaller and smaller. But it's not getting a lot of nutrition from that. Its nutrition is coming from the covering. And then, after that has been digested, out the material comes at the other end in the form of a fecal pellet, with the particles largely smaller. Bigger surface area, more attachment for microorganisms, greater... Isn't it fantastic? I mean, isn't nature wonderful? I think it is. <laughs> So that's what goes on in, in chalk. So I could go on for hours. I could talk about the descent of flocks. I could talk about the impaction of colloids. Some of the insects actually can take colloids from the water. Colloids? What is a colloid? Colloid is a particle that is less than one ten thousandth of a millimeter in diameter. And you think to yourself, how on earth did they evolve that? Well, you can say that it's creation. But, but, but if you believe in it, how on earth did they develop that kind of mechanism? Is it insect that can do this? Insects are secondary invaders. They come from the terrestrial. Went from marine to terrestrial to rivers. How on earth did that evolve? But I'm, I'm, I'm asking impossible questions, and I'm getting so far away from trout, it's not true. <laughs> but if we look at energy flow through chalk stream ecosystems, because they're the particular streams and rivers that particularly, I think, interest us in this audience, we would have to say that the dominant organisms in chalk streams are rooted plants. I think you'd all agree with me on that. And the microorganisms. And, of course, we don't see them. We know of their presence. You can sometimes pick up a stone and feel that it's a bit slippery. If you look at it under a microscope, you'll see that it has biofilm. Not over everything, but there will be biofilm. Now, you see biofilm actually on plants, living plants. You'll notice that there's a diatom biofilm on parts of the water crow fern. And in fact, if we measure the respiration, the biological activity of the various components, plants come out on top by miles. Next group, microorganisms. Then all the animals. Does that surprise you? And the single most important group of compounds, because we're not just dealing with the living organisms, the bacteria, the fungi, the algae, the plants, rooted plants, the invertebrates and the vertebrates like trout, the single most important compounds are exopolymers. Thanks very much. <laughs>